this episode of Hayden Films Talks presented by the Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival. I'm your host, Kelly Adkins, and today I'm joined by Michael McRae, the co-founder and managing director of the Whistleblower Summit and Festival. And today we're going to be talking about these recent incidents involving the alleged term fake whistleblowers. Now, Michael, we've talked a little bit about how this term whistleblowers in itself has a lot of prestige and not a lot of prestige in terms of the acts that is actually being done against organizations that might have fraud in them. So why don't you talk to me a little bit about the danger of misusing this term whistleblower first? Thank you, Kelly. Um, let me start off by just talking about the origins of the term whistleblower. And um, the way that we mm -hmm. use it today is really the product of essentially the 1970s. It's either essentially the post Watergate era and then there was also um, um, unsafe at any speed, Ralph Nader, so it's consumer products. So the way that we use it now is roughly 50 years old. Now, if you look up the term whistleblower in the, in the dictionary, yeah. one of the problems that you'll see, or from, from our perspective, is that it's a list of 20 or 30 pejoratives. It's, it's red, it's pink, it's snitch, cattle tail. It's, it's nothing really, really honorable. And one of the core missions of the Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival is to restore the term whistleblower back to its historical pr perspective, which is really truly, um, we're, we're patriots. And to put it back in this historical perspective, mm -hmm. and then also to talk about, um, to clearly establish kind of what is and what isn't a whistleblower. And we're, we simply say that a whistleblower is somebody who sees something wrong and tries to fix it. So again, we're, we were kind of the white hats. Now, Interestingly enough, while the term whistleblower came about in, in the 1970s, the first whistleblower um, law was actually passed by the Continental Congress on July 30th, 1778. So really whistleblowing mm -hmm. is very much akin to the First Amendment. And so I'll probably paraphrase it poorly, but essentially the first whistleblower act was the Congress declared that it's the duty of every American citizen to report to Congress at first opportunity, governmental wrongdoing. So it's essentially the way that one of the checks and balances that we have in the Constitution is the people have to report to Congress when the government does something wrong. And so that kind of, when you mm -hmm. start to look at it, 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 it's, you know, one might argue that, you know, the British are coming, the British are coming, the midnight ride of Paul Revere is the public alerting the, the people that there was a threat by the, the tyranny of the crown. So it, it really goes back mm -hmm. that far. Whistleblowing is as American as apple pie. So, so one of the, <laughs> so one, like of the that. Yeah, one of the problems that we have is because kind of this no stitching, snitching culture or whatever. And, um, and again, I guess even Socrates said that it was either Plato or Socrates that said the, um, the most hated person is he who tells the truth. And it's always that kind of that truth shall set you free kind of language. And um, there are people who really mm -hmm. live that, who live that and speak truth to power. And those are whistleblowers and those are kind of our tribe. And so we, that's why we celebrate them at the Whistleblower Summit. And um, part of the interesting thing that's happened now is that it's so, when you're able to describe whistleblowers honorably, there are a lot of people that are, so we say whistleblower adjacent or whistleblower sort of um, people that fit in that space. And what we always want to, and Marcel Reed, the festival director for the summit, one of her favorite things to say is that, you know, the whistleblowers are people who um, tell the truth when there's something to lose. And it, it, so it, it's not, I'm not really a whistle. Well, we don't really consider you a whistleblower if after getting busted and indicted that you turn state's evidence. So for us, um, Sammy the Bull Gravone is not a whistleblower. You know, he was a, well, I guess I'm not, he's not even an unindicted, um, unindicted co-conspirator. He's a co-conspirator. So blowing the whistle after the fact, after you've been caught as a way to, um, to get a plea deal, you know, that's kind of the definition of a rat. We don't consider those people whistleblowers in, in, in the sense that we use it. Or let's say you have somebody who, who gets fired um, and they didn't say they were quiet while they were working and they were going along 
to get along when they had their job, but after they've been removed from service, then all of a sudden they now decide they want to blow the whistle. Well, well, for us, the person who, who you want to honor is the person who takes the risk to tell the truth when there's something to lose. It's not the person who steals information from your, your company. It's a person who has access to information while they're doing their job and they realize that this is something that's problematic. This is something that's wrong. This is something that hurts people. It's not the person that breaks into your house and steals your laptop because they want to tell your secrets. For us, those aren't whistleblowers, but you can get into a long conversation and you talk about, um, you know, Linda Tripp and um, Linda Tripp and, um, ooh, um, Monica Lewinsky. Um, for me, Linda Tripp is not so much a whistleblower, um, but more so a, a kind of more of a political operative. Um, but, you know, again, different, uh, different people, um, have different points of view on that, but that's what we try to, to encourage and what we try to promote at the whistleblower summit. So I hope I didn't, I hope that wasn't too much for your question. I, I kind of took the long way around. It gave, it gave us a lot of runway to start conversating about no problem. Mm -hmm. I think that what it boiled down to into your, um, statement is it sounds like that Based off of the origins of becoming and being a whistleblower, it depends on things like intention, timing, and the impact afterwards, right? If you're benefiting from that or if you might be losing something from that. Um, and something that you really said that I kind of wanted to pick your brain about is it's talking about how you are acquiring this truth, right, with that intention. So I know that in offline discussions, we had chatted a little bit about James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. So I know that obviously Project Veritas has been under some sort of investigation per se in terms of how they are going to be accessing their material to expose the truth, right? Um, so what is your take on not only Project Veritas's methods, but James O'Keefe and how maybe how he led um, the team while he was still head of that organization? Okay. Well, Project Veritas and James O'Keefe, they are actually a part of the origin story of the Acorn Aid. The Acorn Aid is, of course, the organization that actually hosts, um, founded and hosts the Whistleblower Summit Film, Film Festival. And um, just in terms of recapping, um, the story of ACORN we, is that there was a, um, the Association of Community Organizations for Reform now is one of the most powerful and venerable civil rights organizations in history. Um, founded in the 1970s, they, ACORN was a grassroots organization that took on not only corporations, but could build, that could bend industries to their will. And it was one of the most unknown and secretive organizations um, during that time that always, ACORN was a, was a group that flew under the radar. And they would always appear to be, you know, three or four little old ladies, but they were really a hundred million dollar multinational corporation that was fighting. And so um, I was, at one point in time, I was on the board of ACORN with, with along with Marcel Reed. And, um, Around that time, there was a multi-million dollar embezzlement by the um, the brother of the, I guess, the co-founder. And that became a tremendous inside whistleblowing story. Um, essentially, you had, Acorn had at that point in time, 400,000 member families and a 50 to 60 member board. And so there were eight board members who actually stood up and fought for truth, transparency, and accountability following the, um, the discovery of the embezzlement. And they became known as the Acorn Eight. And so this was a story, this was back in the, um, I'm gonna screw the dates up, but roughly um, 2010, um, Acorn was the organization where uh, former president, you know, I guess then Senator, now former president Barack Obama had trained um, trained ACORN board members, and he'd been a member of um, an affiliate organization called Project Vote. So part of his political chops came up through not so much the Democratic Party, but through community organizing. And that's kind of his, his claim to fame. And so he, he utilized the utilized those, strat those same strategies to kind of take the White House, and ACORN used it to 
fight for bettering communities all across the country. Once we discovered kind of this internal rot, the um, the Acorn Eight fought to um, fought to right the wrong, to right that ship, and um, that's, that's, fought to fight that that ship, and it became a national, if not international, story when the um, the news of the the, the embezzlement broke, and uh, we wound up going on um, CNN, Fox News. Actually, I think our story was probably the story that the spark that caused um, the Glenn Beck show to kind of take off. Um, eventually, his take on it um, kind of, at some point in time, we kind of jumped the shark. But um, that was one of the original stories that uh, t- caused all that to happen. So it was one of the most covered stories during that summer, that, that period. And again, I missed the, I missed the years up. Uh, we were covered in, I think, three or 400 newspapers across the nation. And there was a lot that came out of it. During that time, you had also you had people that were working for ACORN that were, well, fi- uh, actually fired. They were became just one of employees that were also speaking out. Um, and that's why there was some confusion between, you know, who the whistleblowers were and who some of Acorn's other detractors are. And so there was a, uh, a young lady by the name of um, Anita Moncrief who d- developed the following. Um, and it was in one sense, it was because she was being viewed as a, a Acorn whistleblower when she kind of was more so the, um, um, she was more of a former employee before she before she took her stand, and then ultimately, there was this move by. It was a I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. It was a different timing then for her in comparison to others. Uh, well, you can get. I mean, again, I, I wrote a book about it: Race, Power, and Politics: Memoirs of Acorn Whistleblower. So you can re- re- the, the, again, it, it's there's a, there's a lot of detail to it, um, mm-hmm. but I, I kind of wanted to delineate the separate lanes because because in, in one sense uh marcel used to be confused for her. they they were mixed up because they were they really they were african-american female women um but sometimes mm-hmm. that's enough um and then a lot of times what would happen is anita was willing to say things that let's say weren't supported this is a, probably the nice way to say it that weren't supported <laughs> that would get attributed to us to the acorn eight and it was there were very different claims that were being made. Um, and then one of the other interesting things was that in this business, if you're willing to carry a narrative, there is opportunity and resources. You know, we were telling the truth. And so the 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 the, the place that the Acorn Eight got caught into was this: we um the the right, the left hated us because we told the truth about acorn the right hated us because we wouldn't lie about acorn we simply told the truth but we weren't we weren't captive to any one narrative only the truth and so there are people that found that it was very it's actually financially lucrative to deliver certain to deliver a certain narrative and um Mm -hmm. anita moncrief kind of got caught into that and then there was also another group a, a, a team um, Hannah Giles and James O'Keefe, and they were, um, they're more activists. They're more political activists. Um, okay. um, O'Keefe was kind of on the citizens journalist side and he created this, um, group, his, his organization was called Project Virtus, um, Verti, however you say it. Um, and he was doing undercover videos and then there became a question, there was like some questionable editing in terms of what he, what was depicted and what the, um, what people thought, but essentially those videos went viral because they essentially, they essentially depicted acorn workers assisting a pimp and a prostitute file taxes, get relief. Um, it was really out. It was, it was really outlandish and that that resulted in an entire media, a media storm where a lot of funding for acorn got cut off. Um, 
it was actually eventually restored, but there was, that was kind of the different things that we're dealing with. So in, in this one story, you have a, I'll just say a whistleblower. It's a whistleblower story. It's a fake whistleblower story. And it's a political activist story. And that's yeah. all wrapped into the story, the origin story of the 8.8 .8 and the Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival. The reason this is kind of relevant today is I think last month, I believe it was last month, that um, James O'Keefe was actually removed from the board of his own organization, Project Vertis. Vert, Vert, Vert. And so right. um, I'm trying to remember exactly what the deals were, deal was, but basically some ethical questions. Um, and yes. I would argue with what was the way that the videos had been um, executed, raised, have raised ethical questions from the inception of his organization. But it took, wow, what, 10 years, 12 years for it to come to pass. Mm -hmm. And that was another mouthful. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. So it sounds like, again, just to recap some things, that the difference in your mind and in the definition of what a whistleblower is slash should be is you should not be blowing the whistle to direct any type of narrative other than the truth. And that's where James O'Keefe came in as falling under that vertical of more of a political activist than a whistleblower to you. Well, let's try this. One is... When the day when they blew the whistle, we were we were board members. We were committed to the cause. We worked. We'd done the actions. We participated in the process. We were had inside information that we legitimately had as board members. So what we were speaking of was from firsthand knowledge. It was nothing, something that was fabricated. It was nothing that was spliced together. It was the real information. Mm -hmm. One of the differences that we had with Anita Moncrief was that. She was more of a low-level employee, um, a staffer, um, and even in, I think, in her some of her court pleadings, her um, defense pleadings, she, essentially she worked in the mailroom. Um, and so a lot of the great quotes that she would give that Acorn is engaged in voter fraud, if you would think about it, she had no way of knowing that information. It, it was impossible. But because the the, the right wanted the voter fraud charge, she was amplified. She was elevated. Mm -hmm. So some of that stuff was was really purely fictional. In terms of James O'Keefe and Hannah Giles, they, with this undercover, you know, so they, they didn't discover any existing information evidence. They essentially manufactured evidence through what was essentially a lie that they, that they told the um, some of the staffers and then they recorded some of the reactions to that. And by the time it was edited and produced for Fox or for the media, you know, you've had B-roll uh, B roll films and, you know, he's in a, a, a chinchilla coat with the, <laughs> with the glasses. And, you know, it's all these things, they're fictional. That, that, that was a costume that was never worn inside the, um, inside the offices of Acorn. It, it, you know, stuff was essentially made up. It was a made up story from a made up story that they told um, some of these low level workers. Mm. And so for it, and actually Kelly, let me go back. There's essentially five important tests of whistleblowing that I, I like to talk about. Mm -hmm. And the very first one is a test of values, morals and values. And that's one of the ways that it, it's, it becomes important to us because that's how, how whistleblowers identify themselves. It is that if you are doing this for the right reason, that's how I recognize another whistleblower. So that definition is very important to me as being someone who's, who's walked that walk. That kind of differs for, for example, there are, there are lawyers who, who represent whistleblowers and profit, profit from whistleblower stories. There are some that feel very differently about, you know, Linda Tripp than I do. They, you know, she gave information, um, you know, it, arguably it impacted the presidency but they're not, you know, they have a kind of a different perspective being. And one of my, I think I've, I've told you this before. It's one thing to cheer for the matador. It's another thing to face the bull. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the cheerleaders. They're the, the whistleblower advocates, you know, versus their whistleblower advocates versus whistleblower advocates, which is 
when the whistleblowers ourselves are advocating for what we think is right and advocating for our cause. That that's one of the differences of the um, the whistleblower summit. Our organization we consist of whistleblowers, and mm -hmm. that's why our perspective is it's a little bit unique. There are more groups that are now forming now, but um, you know, last ten the last decade we have been that voice. But there there are other voices that are now joining the choir. Right. And so in terms of your voice, um, I'm obviously uh, familiar now with your festival and summit as we've had these more in-depth conversations. And each year you have a different theme. So is this year's theme um, kind of in correlation to some of the topics that we're discussing today? Um, tangentially related. It's not so much the fake whistleblower. I think the, the reason that we're having this conversation today is that a, what went on with Project Ver Vertai is very important. And then also there's the um, the select, the House Select Subcommittee on the weaponization. Uh, weaponization of Government. Um, we had concerns about that because they promoted it as having a number of, of, whist of FBI whistleblowers. I, I think they promoted the, 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 that panel, that committee as having access to literally dozens of whistleblowers. And um, kind of what, what, what was produced or what, what, what was publicly produced were people that were very questionable in terms of were they actual whistleblowers or did they fall along the, the, the spectrum of political actors or people who, you know, may, they may just be kind of, I don't like to use conspiracy theorists because it's a pejorative for our community, but were they spouting unfounded truths but given the moniker of whistleblower. And the only reason that, and again, it's a free country and free speech. The only reason it's important to us is because we defend the moniker of whistleblower, because in order for it to be respected, you know, we have to maintain the white hat. And so a lot of times now, and I think we've been successful because before nobody would want to be known as a whistleblower. Nobody knew that whistleblowers would meet, and gather. Why would there be a conference for whistleblowers? You know, we, we've gone through all of that to make, so, make mm -hmm. it so that people do realize that, yes, whistleblowers are providing a public service. And so we try to defend when people trade on that moniker and they're not kind of living up or they haven't lived up to the, um, to the they haven't borne the cross of really being a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of, you know, that that that's why that's why this conversation is important. But uh, but going back to the um, the theme for the summit this year is that whistleblowers are the most effective anti fraud measure. And so now we're getting down to talking about how much what is a whistleblower worth? What what is the truth worth worth one to you as a human being morally, but also to the bottom line. And um, when you start to look at we uh, we had a great year last year with the. Um, we supported the uh, International Fraud Week from the Association mm -hmm. of Certified Fraud Examiners. And yes. to be quite blunt, you know, 5% of a corporation's top line revenue goes out the window to fraud. And whistleblowers are categorically the best anti-fraud device, better than the financial audits, the auditors, your financial statements. It's the value of a whistleblower. And um, I... I I don't want to mess up, but it's, it's a it's a close to forty to fifty percent of fraud are actually detected by inside tipsters by whistleblowers, and I think the number mm -hmm. for which is almost double, I think the number for fraud that's actually detected through your internal control measures and your the audits from outside auditors. So clearly, there is a a, a social value, a moral value, an ethical value to whistleblowing and telling the truth. And then there's also a, a financial value. You know, it goes straight to the bottom line. So we want to celebrate that impact so that hopefully we can continue to grow the summit and continue to grow our audience and to continue to get the public support for um, these courageous individuals who, generally speaking, are just trying to – people who, see, who, who saw something wrong and they tried to fix it wrong. They tried to make it right. Mm -hmm. And that's really who whistleblowers are. Mm -hmm. 
And I know, Michael, we've chatted in some of our previous discussions, too, about how important it is to have this community um, to people who have blown the whistle because of all of the detriment that they face, um, both during and after the, um, they've had to bring these allegations to light. And so for everyone watching, I would definitely encourage to learn more about Michael's summit and festival and the opportunities for the community members, not only through the film festival, um, as well as we've chatted with the, about how art as a medium is very powerful for this topic, but also there is the summit that has those panelists and those sponsors, like he had mentioned the ACFE. And so I know that your next festival is coming up this summer, um, Michael. So what would you have for anyone who would be considering to attend as a word, words of wisdom? Well, one is please, please come participate. We'll, we'll be hybrid again this year. There'll be some live, um, some live events in Washington DC on Capitol Hill, but it will also be available, I guess, really globally now that with, with the internet, we're very much excited about um, the partner that we have now with Sambu that's going to uh, be one of our major sponsors which allows us to add some other capabilities, but we really want to highlight the um, what can be done virtually. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, we live in very trying times. And um, I think it was, um, um, no, it was George Orville in, in 1984. In times of, was it in, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And this is the only community of these such First Amendment revolutionaries, where we we tell the truth, we speak truth to power. That is the core of what our tribe is. That is the core of what we do. And we are a place where you can meet your heroes, you can support us, and um, it's, we also have a lot of fun. So please, everyone is welcome. Excellent. So you heard it. If you are someone who has spoken truth to power, who wants to be empowered to do so, um, learn from others, then make sure to stay up to date with all things Whistleblower Summit and Film Festival. Um, all of the information will be right on this video on how you can get in touch, whether it be submitting your film or attending the event this summer. Thank you for chatting with me, Michael, and I look forward to our future conversations. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Bye-bye.